Hello everyone, welcome back to another one of our Through the Bible studies in which we'll not be going verse by verse, but rather event by event in summarizing these books of the Bible so that you are familiar with the information as you pursue them in personal Bible study. So once again, this isn't to replace personal Bible study, but to encourage you to read about these events on your own time. And this is essentially to point out where those events were taking place in the Bible so you can learn more about them. I'll be summarizing them. And of course, let's start with the historical background of this book. Who wrote the book of 2 Kings? Well, since it covers over a century of history, there's naturally not going to be only one author, but they are cited throughout. If you'd like all of their names in order, leave that in the comments below. But what this book ultimately is, is eyewitness history. It is basically Israel recording their history as they saw it. It's basically the most reliable history that you can have. But it brings the focus to Israel's relationship with God. And it's key to understand this because as we're going to be talking about their kings and all of these people whose names are probably not as pronounceable in my home language that I'm currently speaking as we'd like us to, it nonetheless still applies to our daily lives because it's the same mistakes and also the same decisions and examples that we can follow. The time in which this book was written, or rather the time period that it covers, is from the 7th to the 6th century BC. So that's six, 700 years to 600 years before the time of Christ. And ultimately when we're discussing about this, the focus and attention is on what is now known as northern Israel and southern Judah. Now, the focus of this book is ultimately to show us from the time of Elijah's death. Elijah, note that. It's that famous prophet who was basically the greatest of the prophets of Israel, the most well-known. We're going to be seeing his departure from the scene and ultimately leading up to Israel being taken away into captivity. This is, in a sense, what it looks like to get a last chance with God. And interestingly enough, it covers more than 100 years of those kinds of second chances. But the first event I'd like to discuss is, of course, that event, the death of Elijah. Ahaziah was the king at this time, and he had taken over for Ahab and all that stuff. He was still around. But Elijah basically was just minding his own business, sharing God's word, training up prophets in the name of the true and living God, you know, doing the sort of things Israel was founded to do in the first place. Ahaziah didn't like that very much. And so he sent a group of just basically these large numbers of soldiers, that kind of intimidating gesture, the same thing that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're just like, hey, we're in charge here, man. He wanted to get Elijah taken out of the way. And so the soldiers came up and said, hey, are you a prophet of God? Elijah, knowing exactly what they were there for, maybe the swords and spears are a hint, says, if I'm a prophet of God, then may fire come down and consume every last one of you. And it did, imagine that. So I guess he was a prophet of God. So Ahaziah, not taking a hint as to who was actually in charge here, he decides to send another 50 men. Same thing happens. And so at this point, you'd think, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. He's not taking the hint here that God is the one who's in charge of Israel. He's not the one who's going to put down his prophets. And even though Elijah had basically given up on ministry at this point, he was still being protected and used by God. And that's important to note. When we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. See the New Testament for that one. But when we're talking about this, the third group of 50 men, they were sent by the king, but they at least had more common sense than he did. They just said, not... If you're, are you a prophet of God? We're going to kill you, that kind of deal. They, the guy basically just comes up after the last hundred people died and said, please have mercy on me, I have children. So he, the guy who was sent to get Elijah, he knew as much not to mess with God, let alone his representatives. And so Elijah's like, who are you? He gives him his name, he goes with him. So he stands before Ahaziah, he can't do anything against this guy, and he basically just announces that, dude, you're dealing with a lot bigger things than just your own ego. Let's just leave it at that. And it, he just leaves on his own time. And that was when ultimately God comes to him and says that it's time for you to die. However, his physical death wouldn't be one in which his soul would leave his body. He would be taken up to heaven, body and all. 
And I mentioned that he was basically the head of education in the nation of Israel, that he was the one training the next generation of prophets, the people who would be teaching and demonstrating by example God's word, the same thing we're doing here. And one of these students was a man by the name of Elisha, whom he personally met and recruited for his school. And, you know, he was just plowing his field and working hard for his family. And he said, why don't you come and follow me? It's similar to Jesus, right? And he says, uh, well, can I say goodbye to my family first? And he says, no, when, just like with that plow, you're not going to be able to push straight if you're looking back. Just come, put God first. Elisha joins Elijah's school and becomes one of his best students. And ultimately, when it comes time for Elijah to literally leave this world, Elisha wants to serve God in the same way that he did. Naturally, if you're going to be a student, you want to be like your teacher. But he knows that he's not following Elisha per se. He's following God as Elisha follows God. The same example that Paul gave to Timothy, and to all the churches, rather. He just says, follow me, not because I'm awesome, but because I'm following Christ. I'm heading the right direction. And if I'm not heading that direction, don't follow me by any means. I'm going the wrong way. So Elijah, he says, look, it's not up to me to decide who God uses or not, but here's how you can know that God has chosen you. If you see me taken up into heaven, then the mantle passes to you. And if not, then he's called someone else. And I'd like you to respect that. And Elisha's like, absolutely, I'm not going to mess with God. I want to serve him here. And so they go together. He takes his little scarf, his mantle. And this would basically be the thing that would set them out as the priest of God or the prophet of God, rather. And they they come to this hillside that's surrounded by a body of water. He just swipes it with his scarf, and the water parts, just like with Moses. They walk on dry land, and a roaring chariot, horses, angel, and all, picks Elijah up, and the thing is composed of pure fire. And so Elijah is just like, oh my goodness, this is an interesting experience. And he sees Elijah being taken up. He doesn't just disappear off the face of the earth, instantly translating from the physical to the spiritual. He sees the spiritual event taking place. And what's interesting enough is the scarf that was around Elijah's neck, it stays behind. And as it's falling down, Elijah is able to pick it up. And he officially takes over his ministry. And what's also interesting about this is he didn't just ask for the right to inherit that position, but he asked for a double portion of God's spirit, that he would be able to serve God twice as much as Elijah did. And that's exactly what happened. You see, the ministry of Elijah after the death of Elisha, or rather Elijah, Elisha, this two close names here, this is difficult in English, but just follow along here. Elijah's in heaven now, physically taken up bodily as an example and practice of what the rapture ultimately will be. But when we're talking about the ministry of Elisha, the miracles that he performed, I can just name 12 for you as far as listings. There were others, but note some of these because you might catch some parallels, not just in the teachings of Christ like Elisha, but the actions of him as well. The first miracle that Elisha did was there was a well in Jericho that was poisoned. It was undrinkable. And so what he did was he poured some salt into it. You know, that's not going to help the situation. And yet, for some reason, they were able to draw water out of the well, and it became drinkable. Seems like a miracle, doesn't it? And also, make a note of that. Cleansing water. This is a well that we can still visit in Israel today that has fresh drinking water. And yet, at one point in history, it was undrinkable, except by the intervention of God through his prophet Elisha. Another miracle he did was when, just like with Elijah before his passing, a group of people, and this is a lightning rod of controversy for a lot of skeptics because they don't just plainly read the text, but a group of 50 people, they say young men, but understand that that term can be anywhere from 13 to 30. And these were the people that were coming out from a city who were training up their own generation of prophets, but they were the prophets of Baal. Remember the prophets that Elisha was dealing with who would execute, hunt down, and torture 
the people who worshipped any other god but Baal, and the people who mutilated themselves in order to gain the favor of the rain god and so forth. We're, we're talking about a very unsavory group of people, and when you have 50 of your friends with you, probably not the best of intentions. Now they say, oh, Elisha did this, what he's about to do, to these kids, because they made fun of him for being bald. And while the statement they said was, go up, you bald head, go up, what were they referring to? Perhaps the one who had gone before him, who went up. Do you think that Elisha was quiet about this? That when he actually received these words and recorded them as history, that they would have kept this to themselves? Well, if they did, then we obviously wouldn't be reading it today. The entire nation knew about what happened to Elisha. And what was interesting about this is when they were saying go up, they were basically threatening his life. They were saying, we're going to send you up too. And so, just like with the fire being called down from heaven when the last group of 50 people tried to approach him, Elijah just said, hey, God's going to deal with you. He laid a curse on him in the name of the true and living God. I know it's not the fancy curse that did anything. It's the fact there was authority behind those words. And two mama bears... And for those of you who've ever been hunting, you know, you don't mess with mama, especially when she's over 400 pounds and highly motivated to get between you and her cub. Two mama bears came in and mauled these guys to death. And if you understand the context, it's hilarious. But understand God's establishing that Elisha is the one inheriting this ministry. A third example, he stays in the house of a widow and her son, who basically are on the brunt end of a famine. If you remember, the three and a half years without rain, we're probably still feeling the residual effects of all of that. It's not just enough for suddenly rain to come back and then the crops are suddenly aerable again. They needed more. The water cycle may have been restored after Elijah, uh, Elijah rather, Elijah's prayers, but they were still in a tough spot. And so this woman who couldn't work and her son, who was basically no better a state than she was, all they had to their name was a cup of oil and some bread. And they were going to eat the bread, and basically that would be all that they would have. They'd just starve to death after that. Well, Elisha comes to their house. And so the woman's just basically getting writing her will and testament. I'd like the cup of oil to stay here because we don't know anybody anymore. And Elisha comes in and says, uh, hey, I'm kind of hungry. I see you have some bread there. Can I have that? And she says, look, this is all we have left. I'm going to eat this with my son, and then we're basically going to die. And Elisha says, tell you what, you give that to God, representative here. He'll pay you back. Sounds like the kind of deal I'd want to be a part of. And so she agrees. They feed him for one meal, and then Elisha thanks them and says, all right, you see that cup of oil? Here's how God's going to repay you. Go around and gather as many jars as you can possibly lay your hands on. It doesn't matter if they're small or large, just any container that will hold liquid will do. And so they went to their neighbors. They grabbed just big pots and cups and so forth. And they got a fairly sizable amount. And they say, okay, now what? And he says, just take that little cup of oil and pour it. Okay, I guess it's nice that we'll be able to have it in a nicer cup. I, we have to return these though. And so they start pouring the oil and pouring the oil and pouring and pouring and pouring and then the jar's almost full and they're like, there goes another one. And pouring and pouring and literally until every last jar that they had gathered was filled, there was still oil in the cup. I definitely repaid them on that. They were able to sell the oil and then basically live off of that through the famine. So, <laughs> or donation on that part. Another interesting situation was when Elisha was staying in another person's house. This woman, a Shunammite, was the area that she was from. She wanted a child but couldn't have one. And so she came to this prophet of God and said, Why don't you stay in our guest house and just make a place in our home for you? And Elisha could tell that he was wanted for more than one reason. So he says, what do you want from me? And she says, I, I just want a child. 
Now, this is where the secular people are like, so did Elisha do what the husband didn't do? No, not at all. He just says, God will give you a child. Thank you for providing room in your home. And so, staying true to her marriage, and Elijah, staying true to the code of ethics expected from a prophet of God, simply put, in context, she had a child the normal way with her husband. But the son was growing up, he was getting into his 20s at this point, suddenly had something wrong with his head. He was just working out in the field, said, my head, my head, and then collapsed, and he was dead. Many people think perhaps it was an aneurysm or something else that happened, heat stroke or whatever, but here's the result. The son died. It's been 20 years since she last had that interaction with Elisha. It probably wasn't staying at her house anymore. And so she goes and she asks to find him, and already she trusts that he's going to do something amazing, sound familiar to anybody. She goes to Elijah and she says, uh, can you just come with me? There's something wrong with the sun. And Elijah already knew. He had a communication level with God that was actually pretty uncanny. He was surprised when God didn't talk to him. And what I'm surprised when God says something to me insightful or something that goes beyond these things. I get excited when that happens. But Elijah, he had it so much, he took it for granted. It's like an internet connection in the United States. We, we get confused when it's not always with us. But that, that's, that's neither here nor there. Elijah comes back and he sees the son and once again the secularists love to say oh see he molested the child no it just says he laid on top of him there is a fine line between what you were doing but ultimately that's what happens is he's praying to god he's breathing on the child he's laying on top of him he's praying to god and he does this over again and then finally the child starts sneezing and he was dead Raising a child to life. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Jesus could do it with just a command. He said, little girl, arise. But for Elijah, the son, he had a lot of faith to practice there. Definitely a miracle worth noting, but it wasn't the last of them. During, uh, once again, still a time of famine, the crops still need to be aerated, but it was probably just the way things went in northern Israel. They were looking for something to eat, just making some soup or something. This guy found this gourd and didn't know it was poisonous. He threw it in the pot. They started to eat it, and they realized what had just happened. We didn't have much food. You've ruined it. What's your problem? Elijah just said, hey, guys, chill out. He took some flour, something edible, and he put it in the pot, and he said, now eat it. Not sure how that's going to help, but it worked with Jericho. Okay, and they eat it, and it was edible. On top of that, it provided for their needs. He just introduced a little bit of flour. Now, is this some miracu- is this some special elixir that he was able to come up with? Did he understand the properties of the pot would be offset by the introduction of wheat? No, it was a miracle. We can just leave it at that. Another interesting situation, which also ties to the ministry of Jesus, was they had about... 20 loaves of barley. Barley bread wasn't that good. It was kind of like more of a cracker-like substance when you were able to do it. Lousy food, but it was enough to to feed somebody. They had 20 loaves of barley. That was enough to feed maybe 5, 10 people if you were frugal. 100 people needed food, and so they'd have maybe a dozen of them were able to eat and so forth, but Elijah just prayed over it and distributed it, and all 100 of them were filled to the gut. Sound familiar to anybody? Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 with much less than this. Are you guys following the logic here? Uh, Another interesting situation that Elisha was used by God was a man named Laman. Or rather not Laman, Naaman. And he was actually not from Israel. He was from Syria, who were the current enemies of northern Israel. What was interesting about this is after, you know, doing a raid on God's people, taking one of the Jewish girls' slave and bringing her back to the house, she made the most of her circumstances and started talking about her nation's God, the true and living God who had shown himself to them in history. And he, she mentioned when she saw her master, her new master who kidnapped her, suffering, instead of saying, well, I know a way to fix you, but I'm not telling. No, she said... I know a guy who can help you. There's this guy who 
He's a prophet of God in our nation, and he's done amazing things. I think that he can cure your condition. And what was that condition? It was leprosy. Leprosy, or what's known today as Hansen disease, it, or the lion syndrome is what it's also known as. It's an interesting ailment in that it causes you not to be able to feel pain. And while some people may think that's a perk, it's not. Because especially in your extremities, people who are in leper colonies, separated from society so they don't spread the infection, if they don't have feeling in their extremities, sometimes they'll end up getting a serious wound and an infection. I, well, I, I won't get into the details about the one I'm carrying right now. Don't worry, I'm treating it, but I'm aware of it is the point. And if I wasn't aware of this infection on my body, it would just be left there to fester and to develop worsening syndromes. Gangrene would set in and I ended up losing an arm. If ultimately these kinds of wounds that would never have gone noticed if not for the signal alert that there is something wrong known as pain, leprosy prevents you from that. And what's also interesting is about the inevitability of these kinds of open sores that would appear on your feet, you know, stepping on a jagged rock or a rusty nail and never noticing it, animals will be able to smell that. And because you can't feel it, oftentimes it wouldn't be rare for someone to wake up in the middle of the night and see their feet nod off to the bone because rats came in and ate it. They wouldn't be able to wake up and shoo the rats away because they can't feel anything. And Naaman was experiencing this malady where he was not only exempt from pain, probably helped him in battle, but the way that he was treating these injuries, it was just a detriment to his life. The, the deadening of his nerves, it was incurable because just like a scar, if you give yourself a third degree burn, then you're never going to feel anything in that area again. Well, if you're basically living with this constant paranoia and reality, it's like, am I currently bleeding out and not know it? It's like, oh... If someone could cure me of this, I mean, I'd even be happy if I just felt pain starting now. I'd definitely be miserable given all the bandages that I have to wear, but oh my goodness, if someone could actually restore the dead nerves, something that even modern science can't do today, we can arrest the development of leprosy, of Hansen's disease, but we can't restore. It would be like lobbing off an arm. We can definitely make sure it's carterized and stops bleeding. Maybe even put a prosthetic, but we can't restore, make you grow back that limb. Well, this is what essentially Naaman was being told that Elisha could do. And so he goes to Israel, he brings all this money, and he's like, yeah, all those godly people, all the prophets, the pagan guys in my country, if they want us to do anything, which is basically nothing, just like good words or something, they want lots of money. So he's probably like one of those. Elijah doesn't even come out to see him. Elisha just says, just dip in the Jordan River seven times. He doesn't even come out to see him. He just sends somebody to tell him that. And Naaman's like, I'm a celebrity here, man. Why don't you come out and have me do something awesome? You want me to dip in that river? That river's dirty. I like the other rivers that I got in Syria. I'm out of here. And so he's going off in a huff and feeling all offended and all that. And one of his servants is, you know, kind of keeping things to himself. But it's actually a testimony to Naaman's character because he had a good relationship with his servants. And he said, you know, Master, if he had asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done it? Yeah. Well, if he's asking you to do something easy, isn't that a good thing? Okay, I'll go to the Jordan River. So he does it, dunks himself under once, twice, probably feels stupid after the fourth, the fifth, the sixth time. But it says when he came up the seventh time, not only were the white blotches on his skin gone, but his skin, the areas that had been destroyed by the leprosy that were now pale and rotting, his skin was as pink as a baby. God had miraculously restored him by the authority of his word. And note, Elijah simply told him how God would do it. He comes back and he says, the prophet did it. But Elijah's like, God did that for you. Just thank him. And Naaman's like, you bet I'm going to thank him. I'm bringing this back to my country. Hmm. However, not everyone in Elijah's house was had the kind of character that he had because one of the other guys saw all of Naaman's goods and stuff and he's just like you aren't going to take any of that and he's saying what did I do God's the one who did this let him just keep that stuff it doesn't belong to me we're more than provided for but he's like yeah but I kind of want to raise 
And so he sneaks off without Elisha knowing about it, and he catches up to Naaman, and he says, uh, Hey, um, uh, the prophet uh, there, he, he changed his mind. He doesn't want all the goods, just like a, a little bit. It's maybe like, not millions, but maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Your donation will, of course, be towards a charitable organization. I could use another PS4 or whatever the new systems are now. <laughs> you, you get the idea. He, he wants this for himself. So he's like, oh yeah, happily. Just take it. Just thank you guys so much. And so he ha has the silver and all the gold check coins and all that kind of stuff. He hides it. And you know, going about his business, sweeping and stuff. And Elisha comes up to me. He says, uh, where were you? He says, oh, I wasn't anywhere. Says that to the guy who regularly hears from God. And so Elisha, disappointed for sure says, Gehazi, you're trying to take advantage of something that God did. If you wanted something from God, you could have just asked, but now instead you decided to rob him. And from that time forward, he started sweeping his broom and he's like, this thing got lighter all of a sudden. He looked down at his hands and they were white. That counts as a miracle because it's not just one thing to contract leprosy, it's another thing to transfer it to someone else. A group of people were working. Another miracle of Elijah and his ministry. <laughs> this is actually a lot of fun. They uh, were working with the axe head, and obviously this isn't something they had a lot of, especially under military occupation. The one thing that a tyrannical government wants to do is take away your weapons. So the only thing that people were allowed to have were farm tools. You guys remember during the time of Judges, one of them was uh, the original ninja. He used farming equipment as a weapon. This guy was swinging the axe head and definitely probably the only one they had to their name. And he even had to borrow it. So definitely something he wanted to take care of. He goes back for a chop and the blade edge of the axe flies off and goes into the river. And, and note the deep part of the river, the dark part of the river, the part that you can't just go in and retrieve it, even if you hold your breath real hard. And so the guy's freaking out, and he's like, oh my gosh, I lost the axe head. And he goes to Elijah, and he says, I, I lost the axe head. Can you, like, make another one? And he says, no, where's the axe? And he says, well, the stick's here, the blade's in the water. He says, tell me where it fell in. And so he, he looks around and you know, sees the little square outline among the circles so he takes a stick and he throws it into the water and the axe head becomes buoyant and floats to the surface and he says go get it i don't think that's how metals work <laughs> so once again a miracle that elisha was able to perform in verifying the authority behind him as a prophet of god this one's a lot of fun <laughs> one of the the tenth one that I put on this list, the king of Syria, and note the guy that Naaman was working for. Granted, he had other generals that were performing these attacks on Israel, making sure they didn't have any weapons, making sure if they saw an attractive girl, they'd kidnap her. If they saw a group of people who had stuff, they'd kill him and rob him. All that kind of stuff that they were just living under at this time. And this Assyr the Syrian king was having trouble because now that the current king was starting to take his relationship with God seriously again, he would come to Elijah and say, what does God uh, say? And he says, oh, well, the Syrians are going to attack you here. They'll have this many men bring these weapons. And so every time the Syrians tried to attack Israel, they were ready for them. And the king's getting upset. He's like, one of you guys must be a traitor. And, and they're all like, no, we're not a traitor. There's a prophet of God there. Didn't you hear Naaman tell us all about him and his God? He knows, he doesn't just know what you're going to attack. He knows what you say to your wife when you guys are in bed together. I'm probably turning beet red at that kind of statement. And note, I'm not being over dramatic here. That's literally what the Bible says. But, <laughs> but the, the king's like, well, I got to take this guy out then. I can't have him sharing that information. And so he gets together his team of his best soldiers, assassins, you know, the chariots and the weapons and the bows and all that kind of stuff. And they go to Elijah's house. They surround it. And, you know, one of the servants, not the one that has leprosy, he'd be kicked out by now. But the, the, one of the servants comes out and, he, you know, gets a newspaper. He's got his cop and he looks up and there's like tanks everywhere and stuff. If you can do a modern reinterpretation because i mean we already mentioned the newspaper we're kind of doing free ball here 
And so he slowly steps back inside the house and goes to Elijah and says, we're dead. The, the, the enemy's around. We're surrounded. And Elijah's like, we're not surrounded. They're surrounded. There's more on our side than there are on theirs, to directly quote him. And the servant's like, well, and I'm quoting Levi Lusco here. I love this illustration of this. He says, well, for sure you and me, and it's like maybe 60 of them. I don't see how we're outnumbering them here. And Elijah just says, just let him have faith for five seconds. And so the servant looked outside the window again, and he saw armies of those same chariots that took Elijah into heaven, just composed of pure fire. And what was once, oh my gosh, we're surrounded. And he's like, oh my gosh, they're surrounded. Interesting perspective when you see things from God's eye view. So Elijah comes out to meet him and he's like, we're going to kill you. And he says, oh, are you now? And then suddenly they're like, are we? What's, what's going on? Where am I? Who, who are you? What, what, what's this? Who, who am I? And, and basically, it says they became blinded, but it wasn't just blinded in a sense like, I can't see what's going on here. They literally just became incapable of understanding anything that was going on. And so just like this bumbling group of guys high on pot, he, Elijah just comes up to him and says, hey, guys, uh, what are you guys doing? It's like, guys, my guy, hi, guy, I'm guy, I'm guy, nice, hi, guy. And, and he says, why don't you come with me? And so Elijah is basically just leading this herd of doped out sheep. And, <laughs> and they're just tumbling. It's just like, okay, we're following the bald guy. And then call him that, of course. But it's like just going to sort of follow the shine. And then finally, <laughs> he leads them into Samaria, which is the capital of northern Israel, where obviously all of their military is waiting. <laughs> and he brings him into the king's court where everyone's got their bows ready on him, right? And then finally, Elijah just turns off this the orb of confusion, to use a SpongeBob reference, and they realize where they are. And, oh no. <laughs> and the king's son's just like eager about this. He's like, should we kill him? Should we kill him? Let me kill him. I'll do it. I'll do them all right now. And... The king looks at Elijah, and Elijah's looking at him. Want to show the heart of God here, man? And the king says, no. Give them a meal. Send them on their way. What was interesting was, the, while the Syrians were still at war with Israel, those men never attacked them again. Give them the opportunity to see God's heart in action. That's a witness in of itself. The, towards the end of his life, he predicted a prophecy. He's a prophet after all. He can talk about things from God's perspective and in this context it was the future. He predicted the end of the Syrian siege and as well they were surrounding the city making sure food wasn't coming in and they were in this city while people were starving. They couldn't get food out or in. There, there wasn't Amazon drones to drop in food to feed them or anything. They basically were just without a luck and what was really kind of sad about this whole thing was the king trying to take his relationship with God seriously, right? We'll, we'll get into which king it was in Second Chronicles. But this king, he wants to do the right thing, but he's still trying to put on a good face for the people. And this lady comes up to him and says, King, King, I have a civil dispute I want you to sort out. And wanting, even though he's hungry and stuff, he's like, Well, absolutely, ma'am. What, what can I do, do for you? And she says, Um... I had a son, and we cannibalized him yesterday, but we also agreed that if we cannibalized my son first, then we would cannibalize my friend's son the next day, and she's hiding her son. So can you tell her to let her son out so we can eat her baby? There was a lot of things going through that king's mind at that time, but it was probably not, boy, when I took the crown, these were exactly the kind of civil disputes I thought I'd be handling. Oh my gosh, this was bad. And so he goes to Elijah and he's like, dude, what, 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 what? I tried to take my relationship to God. Seriously, this is where you lead us? And Elijah said, hey, tomorrow you can have more food than you know what to do with. One of the king's friends, he just says, shh. God were to open up the gates of heaven. He, he, Elijah literally predicted, he says, hey, a donkey's head to make some soup is selling for like, 
the price of 50 lobsters. Hey, tomorrow they're going to be selling a full, full, like buffet style amount of grain for a few pennies. And he's like, if God were to open up the gates of heaven and literally just flood us with bread, could such a thing be real? Elisha, you're crazy. The Bible is stupid. That, it can't mean what it says. Elijah looked at the guy and he says, you'll see it, but you won't taste any of it. And so, the next day, a group of lepers who were obviously not allowed inside the city for, on account of God's law, not in spreading infectious diseases, but just basically to be in that point, they're starving too. They're victims in this just like everyone else, even though they're living in a separate area. But they go into the camp and they're like, look, we're going to die either way. So why don't we go into the Syrian camp, or the Syrians rather, the us Syrians were different, the Syrian camp, and we'll, we'll see if we can get some food off of them. And if they don't and they kill us, well, we're going to die anyway, so why not? And they go into the camp, and for some reason, no one was there. No, no one had died, but for some reason, the camp was empty. Like there's some things like tumbled over and stuff. It's almost as if they all ran off screaming from something. Hey, that guy was making breakfast. And so they start eating the freshly prepared food that they all just even bother. Like maybe some of it was burnt because they left the stove on or whatever. But they're just like, there's food, there's meat, there's bread everywhere. And these lepers are just like, oh my God, this is awesome. It's... They look at the city. And they're like, you know what? This isn't right. We're already full. We have more than we know what to do with, but they're they're literally eating each other in there. Why don't we let them know? Okay, so they go to the city and they see lepers coming. It's just like, hey, unclean, unclean. And they said, no, 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 no. The camp's the camp's empty. There's food, and everyone hears that, and the gates, the city gates open, and they're just like, the Syrians aren't shooting at us food and the guy that had doubted god's word the day before he's like will you all please form an orderly line and gets trampled to death so on that point being made and then finally the final miracle i think that needs to be worth noting as far as elisha's ministry was at the end of his life before he was going to die he predicted prophetically, the failures of a king whose name was Jehoiahaz that he basically wouldn't live to see as far as the failures were concerned. He didn't just point out current events. He says, you're going to fight the Syrians, but because your faith in God only goes so far, he's only going to take you as far as you trust him to. And then he also goes to another king whose name was Hazael, and he tells him, you're going to be the next king of Syria. You're, oh my gosh. And he, he just starts crying. He's like, what's the, what's the matter? And he says, I've seen the things that you're going to do. You're, you're going to rip open pregnant women and crush their babies on the rocks. You're going to, you're going to murder your own family. You, you, oh my gosh, I can't even just look at you. And he's like, am I a dog that I would dare even think of doing such of these things? Well, the next day he smothered the previous king of Syria in his sleep and not 10 years later he was doing all the things that Elijah said he would but nonetheless Elijah's ministry comes to an end at that point and note this goes beyond and into some of the things that we'll be discussing now but these are the overall impacts that Elisha had on the ministry and definitely setting up a lot of precursors to the person of Jesus Christ feeding multitudes without the means to do so, introducing new rules to laws of nature, curing incurable diseases, all of these things are being set up. But this is where we start to alternate a little, because just like the prophets of God have been at work here, if you remember, there was also a prophetess in Israel who was still a problem that needed to be dealt with. Her name, of course, was Jezebel. Jezebel, the daughter of the king that Ahaz, or that, uh, yeah, that Ahab had done to basically want to make Israel Muslim. Because let's just be honest, Baal worship is about 90% of what makes up the Muslim religion today. 
She would hunt down and murder the people of God. She's the one who threatened and basically made Elisha suicidal. She was the one who enforced and made Israel reject the true and living God and popularized Baal worship in its place. And again, they all made these decisions to follow her, but she was a really dangerous lady. And she had been given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after all this exposure to God's word, after seeing miracle after miracle to confirm who she was messing with was not to be messed with, that there actually was a God that didn't make it rain in that regard or in that regard, but just the thing that she grew up with and that she would kill because it was fun. She decided that it was ultimately going to be her way, not God's way. And after decades, after decades, after decades of this nonsense, God finally called her to be accountable for it. A man named Jehu took power in Israel. And he was especially anointed by God. And note, just going out and murdering people, not good. But God is the one who gave you life. That's what means it's not good. It's not ordained by God. God is the one who gave life. What right do you have to take it? But when Jehu is risen up, it was to be a tool of judgment in the same way that the people of Israel were and saying, note, Israel's government, you're going to be called as the next king of Israel. We're doing a restart. I've given these people over 40 years of second chances and they've rejected them. So you are going to be the one to execute them. And it was set in a court of law. So understand this. He's not just going all matching Islam for Islam in this regard. He has God behind him in this. He would undo the damage that Ahab had done and would give Israel a fresh start. And the, one of the most significant things that he did was he came to Jezebel's court. She was an old lady at this time. And from his horse, he called out and says, Jezebel's come down and face justice from the true and living God. Obviously not answering her doorbell. So he calls out to the window and says, hey, any servants in there? of hers. Are you tired of this? If you're on our side, throw her down. If not, then we're coming in. Well, <laughs> they took a hint. They grabbed the old lady. She's kicking and screaming, but obviously not capable of much beyond the pen and paper. And they throw her out the window and apparently tumbled a little bit on the way down because blood was streaked down the temple, or rather her palace. And Jehu's horse trampled her to death. He goes inside and he has a nice meal. Then he thinks about it for a second. He's like, you know, she was literally a monster, terrorist, the most corrupt politician we've ever had in history. She'll be a byword for a corrupt woman for almost millennia to come. But she is a king's daughter. Why don't we go and give her a proper burial? We'll go get her body. And so one of the servants comes out to get her body and dogs had eaten her alive. And you know what's also interesting about this was there were only two parts of her left. Her hands and her feet. Interestingly enough, the same areas in which Jesus was pierced. She decided to take that on herself too. What was interesting about that too is that the hyenas, the carnivorous scavenger dogs that you see in Israel today. I've seen them. They're not pretty. They, to this day, don't eat hands and feet of human beings. That's noteworthy. However, Jezebel wasn't the only problem in Israel. Ahaziah, who was the son of Athaliah, and I'm not just saying that to be all fancy and genealogical. Remember that name, Athaliah, because she'll be important in a second. Ahaziah was the king of Athaliah in Judah, corrupt king of, Israel, of Judah, rather, who was executed by Jehu. He was visiting Joram, who was one of Ahab's sons, current king of Israel there. He tried to run for his life. He got shot. So, not with a gun, with a bow. But then finally, to give Israel its clean slate, he gathered up all the prophets of Baal along with Ahab's remaining sons, sons, and he executed all of them. They understood not only from the miracles that they had seen, but also because of the personal choices they've made to reject that witness and say, we're going to worship our gods anyway. They were now under the authority of God's law. They could be held accountable for what they knew, and they knew better than what they were doing. 
And so by being these prophets of Baal, they were committing the capital offense of spreading false prophecies in Israel. And knowing the consequences, but doing them anyway, Jehu enforced it. And this was ultimately what saw the end to Jezebel's reign. Kind of. We'll go more to that in a moment, but understand this. As far as Jehu is concerned, he definitely knew how to deal with problems on the outside. When God told him to do something, he did it. But when it came time for him to go home at the end of the day, he kind of left his God talk at church. And that isn't... Well, I'll just read the passage here. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 31. In light of all that he did, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed from the sins of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin. For those of you who remember 1 Kings, Jeroboam's sin was when he didn't trust God to preserve the nation that he had given to him. He decided to replace the true and living God, the temple of God, the worship of the God of Israel with the golden calf that their ancestors worshipped in the wilderness. Kind of forgetting what happened before and after that, but nonetheless, he got himself mixed up with idols. And because of this, God said, look, because you have done this, Israel's going to survive a little bit longer. But your family will only be on the throne for four more generations. Now that's where we put a pause for a moment on the nation of Israel and go down to Judah. Because remember when I mentioned that Ahaziah was the son of Athaliah. Now Athaliah was a girl. Generally not the kind of person that you'd expect to hear in a historical narrative of Israel's history. Definitely a patriarchal society, and that's not in the Twitter way of saying that. It's literally just man-led. But this woman, Athaliah, she was, she was a gem. She was the mother of the king of Judah that died and decided, well, since Jehu's taking care of all of my relatives and I'm still in royal connections here, there is a son, there's actually a lot of sons, who are next in line for the king of Judah, relatives of King David. And remember, that is important because King David would be the family his family would be the one in which Jesus would biologically enter this world through. That's why we're told of his family history, not only going back to David, but Abraham in Matthew chapter 1 through Joseph. And also in Luke chapter 3, we're told about Mary's biological family, also going back to David, to Abraham, and also to Adam. Although I think we can all tie ourselves back to him at that point, but you understand he was human, he was Jewish, he was Messianic, he was from the family that the Christ was to be born from. And so when we're talking about this guy, Jesus, we're talking about someone who's going to do something very important, but not without opposition, right? Because how many times has Satan tried to thwart the plan of God in introducing himself to this world through the nation of Israel? We can go back to the compromise that Abraham made with Hagar, not exactly what you'd call a military threat, though. We can go to the book of Exodus, where the pharaoh of Egypt became paranoid, I wonder why, of being outnumbered in the nation by the Israelites. And even though they were no threat to him, he treated them as such and tried to wipe out the nation by murdering all of its boys and forcing all the girls into marriage with Egyptians. That, of course, failed. We can go back to the time of the judges, where Israel basically set them up for self-destruction. We can go back to the time, we can go forward to the time, rather, going to the time of King Herod, trying to wipe out all of the Jews when he found out the king would be born. He says, no, I'm king. I'm going to kill the king. When Jesus himself was born. We can talk about the Holocaust. We can talk about all these things. But ultimately, it just ties back to what we read in Revelation 12. The enemy has been going after Israel the moment that she was chosen to bear that child, the child that would rule all nations with the rod of iron, the child that would be God incarnate. Talk more about him and those prophecies when we get to Isaiah and to Revelation and to Daniel. But when we're talking about Athaliah, she was simply one of another of these attempts by Satan because Athaliah, when her son got killed, 
she got an idea. Why well, stop there? You see, Athaliah was a daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. And Israel had come to this alliance. Ahaziah got killed when he was visiting the, the corrupt king of northern Israel during this time period. And again, if you need clarification on this, I know it's maybe difficult to keep track of. You can read through the passage. I'll summarize it, hopefully, in a more clear term if you ask in the comments. But uh, Athaliah, she was the mother of the king of Judah. And when her son died, she decided to take advantage by murdering all of the rest of her relatives. Wipe out the entire family of King David that she married into so that she could be the only queen of Judah. This was big because whether she knew it or not, she was fulfilling the will of Satan in attempting to destroy God's promise of Jesus coming into this world. Because God told David in 2 Samuel, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to enter this world through your family line. However, she missed one. Just like with Moses, just like with Joseph, just like with the warning that was given to Joseph and Mary. The one child that she missed that would carry on the family of King David was named Joash. He was raised in the temple of God. The little priest. Wouldn't be differentiated. She'd know she was related to him. And of course, Athaliah never went to the, the temple of God. She went to her own temple. She left that thing alone. And what was interesting was when Joash was seven years old, they announced him as king. Athaliah, being as old and crotchety as her mother at this point, she said, treason, treason, you guys are doing something horrible. How dare you attempt to defy the rightful authority in Israel for your own gain. Dang it. <laughs> now, she, she was too callous at this point to even care that she was being pretty hypocritical about this. She, you know, came over through a walker and she's like, give me that baby. I'm going to strangle it. They dragged her out the side of the city and cut her head off and rightfully shows she's deserved it. But here's the interesting thing. That put an end to the family of Jezebel and Ahab. They killed all the sons, but they forgot that daughter. And boy, was that a big misstep. Joash took over the throne. He was renamed Jehoash, which put God into his name. And he began to do very good things as a king of Judah. He started to repair the temple of God that had been neglected during Athaliah's reign. He restored the worship of the true and living God to Israel. And he, well, I guess one of the negative things he did, he left alone the pagan temples. He didn't attend them, but he didn't confront the evil either. It was a problem, but at least he was heading the right direction. This is where we also put a pause on this, and this is where we see Israel, northern Israel, die. So, we've gotten that update in Judah, when Jehu took over the throne in northern Israel, Jezebel and Ahab were wiped out. Their last surviving daughter literally brought hell on earth in southern Judah till she was wiped out. Now for Elisha. Remember, he's still alive during all of this. He's ministering mostly to northern Israel. Elisha is sick and he knows he's going to die, so he calls King Jehoahaz to show how much he trusts God. And long story short, not much. This marked the rest of his life, and they were essentially under the heel of Syria when all was said and done. Yet because they were still God's people, God gave them seven last chances. Jeroboam II does not honor God. Azariah doesn't really take sides, but that's the problem, because he didn't confront any evil in his nation. While he did have a relationship with God on his own, he does not remove the idols, the temples to the idols like he should have. So that chance is passed up. This is basically it's one step back, one step still. Then two steps back with Zechariah not honoring God, and finally Shalom not honoring God. And in fact, he didn't honor God so much, his people couldn't stand him, and he was killed within a month. By the way, 
all sons of Jehu. How many were that again? Jeroboam, Azariah, Zechariah, Shalom, exactly like God said. The power passes from Jehu's family, his dynasty, if you will, to Menahem, who also doesn't honor God. Pekahiah, after him, doesn't honor God. And then finally, Hosea. He takes power and he does not honor God. And the buck stops there. God judges Israel, northern Israel, by allowing them to be taken over by the Assyrians. And by the way, this was during the time in which Jonah was ministering. Remember, he brought, as unwillingly as he was for the process, the nation of Assyria, the Assyrians, their capital was Nineveh, to a relationship with the true and living God, as reluctant as they may be. And because of their relationship with God, they not only were able to make the wise decision in obeying God when they were used as a tool of judgment, just like Jehu was, but they were also held accountable when the next generation of their family made the same mistakes they did but knew better and judgment was pronounced on them that's the book of obadiah all these things are happening in israel's history and when we get to the prophets we'll talk about where this takes place in history but we're discussing the history first assyrians gather the people of israel up and take them into captivity and this captivity what the assyrians would do is they'd basically destroy a national identity by dispersing them all throughout their empire, which was basically all of the Middle East, the northern Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, as it was called, the habitable portions anyway. And as they were spread out in there, it would basically be like if you and I were kidnapped and say, if you're listening to this in Europe, they'd bring you here to America and we'd switch houses. And so I wouldn't really have the desire to rise up against the Assyrians because I'm proud to be an American and I'm living in Europe. How much more miserable can I be? And likewise, you are probably so used to the, all the I don't know. It's basically, it's the, the same as odd transition for you as for me. They'd destroy national identities. They'd have to learn new languages. They'd have no reason to stay who they were. And so they'd basically just marry and immerse into societies, adopt their customs, and be eliminated. They'd all become Assyrian. However, the Assyrians, as they were living in the land of Israel, they're just like, why is like everything hating us here? It's almost like we don't belong here. Hmm. Hey, can you, can you maybe like bring those Jews back? They can tell us how to handle all these animals and bugs and all these other things because it seems like there's something supernatural here. It's like everything wants to kill us. And so the Jews were brought back, but the problem is the Jews weren't Jews anymore. They had intermarried with the, with the Assyrians and they became known from that point on as the Samaritans. So there's a little historical background for you. Now, this is where the story cuts off for Israel, northern Israel, historically. They've been wiped out. Now, the story continues going back to southern Judah, now that northern Israel is back out of the picture. And they've had a string of pretty bad kings. Good ones, too, like King Uzziah. But then there's also kings like Ahaz, and not Ahab, but Ahaz. And all these people, you had those who honored God, those that didn't. But basically, it was like a... Well, every political spectrum ever. You either have one good leader, one bad, one good, one bad. You learn your lesson, then you take them for granted, elect a bad. You decide you like the other ideas better, you like the good, you take it for granted, you like the bad. It's that kind of policy. But finally, after the string of ungodly kings, after Jehu, Hezekiah comes to the throne. And he was the most godly king that Israel ever had since the time of King David. Now, no, he wasn't perfect, but he definitely didn't pull punches when it came to honoring God, not only by example on his own time, but also in practice with the authority he had as king. See, he did not make his father's mistakes. He followed God, and he even went out of his way to not only tear down the temples to the idols that the other king should have been destroying. If you want to worship a god, that, that isn't real, go to the nations that are playing that little charade, but you're in God's land. So he drew a line in the sand there. He destroyed these temples to the false idols because for crying out loud, you don't want to know what they were doing in them. But he also didn't pull punches when it came to even the good things that were being, that had become obstacles to the best thing. If you remember in the book of Numbers, Moses made this bronze serpent 
and he fashioned it to a pole and it was the image of the cross and that was actually something that Jesus himself used as an illustration in one of the most well-known Bible passages of all time. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, two verses before that, Jesus made reference to the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness, that as uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All of these wonderful pictures, but you know what's the interesting thing? In their history, the reason why Moses made that serpent wasn't to say, this is God. God told him, make this. Why the serpent on the cross? Because, well, Israel had walked away from God and wandered into a snake pit. They came back, apologized, and God said, well, instead of just taking away the problem, I'm going to give them a means to be redeemed from the, from the consequences at least. So what he did was he made this bronze serpent and he said, anyone who looks at it, you'll be healed of your snake bite. It would mean they wouldn't be bitten by the snake again, but it would mean that every single time they started to feel the effects of this poison, they would look and see the serpent and they would be healed. They would see their sin judged on that cross. And the rest, as they say, is history. This is an excellent foreshadowing to Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. The people looked at their history and they didn't focus on the foreshadowing to the Messiah. They looked and said, this thing has supernatural healing powers. It's the God of worship. Let's, let, let's share it with the Phoenicians and the Greeks. and uh, they, they like to call it Hermes. Let, let, let's do that. Let, let's worship this image, the God of healing. And Hezekiah took this relic that was crafted by Moses and he ground it into powder, not by hand, obviously, but he threw the dust on the ground of the temple and said, Nehushtan, literally in Hebrew, it's a thing of brass. It's not a God. So he didn't pull punches. It was just a piece of metal. And if ultimately anything was going to replace God, he'd be doing away with it. Whether it was the pagan temples or the quote-unquote Christian temples that were worshiping and promoting the, a relationship with anything less than God. He said, no apologies here. However, just because he did the right things doesn't mean that bad things still didn't happen. The Assyrians had just taken over northern Israel, right? And now they were going to threaten the people of Judah. I guess they didn't know when to stop. <laughs> but after taking over northern Israel, they come down to Judah. And their king, whose name was Shennacherib, he sends this death threat. And he just says, you let us pass, no problems. But if you try and resist us, if you don't submit to our authority and crown, we'll, we'll take you, we'll send you to this nice place. It's, lu it's luxurious, you're going to love it. That's not at all what he said, but he just basically said, hey, just let us take you to this nice place. It's no big deal, but if you fight us, I guarantee you, you're going to lose, and it's going to be horrible, and it's going to be slow, and everything that you read about us in history in the British Museum and the Taylor Prisms, which is, by the way, horrifying. Ask me in the comments. I've read some of these archives. It is, uh, it is there's no other word. It is ungodly <laughs> what they would do to people especially in combat, before and after they should have had a relationship with God. That's why Obadiah was so harsh on him. But anyway, Hezekiah takes this death threat. He's like, their gods couldn't save them. Why can your God do any different? And Hezekiah says, well, I guess it's not my problem anymore. He puts it before the temple of God, he just lays it in the holy place, and he says, God, this is your problem. You deal with it. And he just leaves. Well, the prophet Isaiah, who is speaking at this time, you know him from the book of Isaiah, he tells Hezekiah, tomorrow, God's going to defend this city. Great. So should I send out some soldiers? No, he'll send his own. What does that mean? You'll see. Well, the next day, 185,000 soldiers composed the Assyrian army. That night, 1,000 or 100,000 and 85,000, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were dead. Do you know how many angels God sent to wipe out this army? Uh, 
However, this wasn't it for Hezekiah. He trusted God, so I never have to do that again, right? Nope. Hezekiah, after this event, almost very shortly after, in fact, he started to develop this little wound, this little bubosur, basically, some sort of infection. And he's like, I should get that checked out. And it turns out to be a terminal diagnosis. Whatever this is, it's going to kill you. So Hezekiah comes before the temple of God and he says, I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die. God, I know that my life is in your hands, but I, I'm not ready to go yet. There's, I, I want to live. God, please give me life. I, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Well, God sends Isaiah and he says, well, God's heard your prayer. He'll give you 15 more years of life. And in fact, he'll perform a miracle so that you can know that he'll keep this promise. And so what God did was he, just like in the book of Joshua, said, watch the sundial, and it turned back. You know, normally it would just continue going on. It turned backwards 10 degrees. I know, obviously, there wasn't a mechanism that God tampered with. He would have had to have stopped the earth's rotation, set it back, and then send it spiraling again. Now, we talked about this in the book of Joshua. How did God stop the planet? in its orbit. Obviously, he didn't stop the sun. That's not what happened. He would have to stop the earth, keep it focused on the sun, then dial it in a reverse orbit, and then send it on its way again. Unnoticeable, unless you were looking for it. But would that have mean that God like stopped the earth? Because the earth's going like a thousand miles an hour at the equator. So if we just all suddenly stop, wouldn't we all fly off? Well, two problems with that logic. One, the force of gravity isn't just the centripetal force that's keeping us on this earth. There's other things that would keep us stable in that regard. But there's also two ways to stop something. You can slam on the brakes or you can apply the brakes. Wouldn't have been hard for God to just slow the earth down, set it back a little bit, and then set it on its way again. He's the one who did it in the first place. And if you still have trouble believing that God would do something like this, go back to Genesis 1-1. If you believe that, this isn't that difficult for him. But nonetheless, the people who were really on to nitpicky details and as far as astrology was concerned were the Babylonians. And they weren't a military power yet. That was the Assyrians. Or at least they were until their army got wiped out by God. But nonetheless, the Babylonians weren't even significant on the world scene yet. They were, they were into their horoscopes and their astrology and watching the stars. And so when they were looking through their little telescopes and stuff, they noticed... Boss! What? We just went backwards! How did we do that? Are you sure you didn't have, like, the microscope on it wrong? It's like, no, look, the stars, we're just giving this chart, and it's, oh, it's crazy! And then they find out about King Hezekiah. And the true and living God was the one who did this. And they're like, well, we got to find out about this guy. And you know what's also interesting is that if you think this was just embellished later, introduced later in history, we have coins dating back to this period. And you know what Hezekiah noted on his mint? The sun in its orbit. But instead of it making a full transition, it goes back and then forward again. The Babylonians knew that something was up, and they wanted to hear about this god who could affect the stars in this way. They spent all their time praying and worshiping and asking the stars, what's my horoscope today, star? And it just goes. It's not going to affect your life in any way. But then they hear about this God. And they go to Hezekiah and they're like, what happened? What did, what did your God do? All the nations want to know about this. I mean, we all noticed. But here's the thing. Hezekiah gave, was given 15 extra years of life. Was that a blessing? Apparently not, because during these 15 years, he started to ebb a little bit in his relationship with God. And when these Babylonians came to Hezekiah and they're like, tell us about your God, all he wanted to talk about was him. He said, hey, look at, look at all of the, the gold we have. Look at this temple, it's the seventh wonder of the ancient world. My, my, my great, great grandfather, Solomon, he built this. And the Babylonians were like, yeah, that's a lot of gold. 
Well, can I take a picture? I, I know my king would want to see this. Maybe he'll come for a visit. Not with his army. And they leave. And Hezekiah's like, I am the best. Isaiah comes up to him and says, What were those guys here for? Oh, they were just here to see the city. Hear about the... He wanted to hear about something I don't really remember. And Isaiah says, God, yeah, him. God just told me that what you have done here today is the reason why the Babylonians are going to come back, burn this temple to the ground, take all of the gold with them. Everything that you've shown them, they're going to take back with them when they come back. And Hezekiah's like, oh no, are, are we all going to, are we going to get all taken into slavery? And Isaiah says, not in your lifetime. And you know what Hezekiah said? Oh, good. Oh, sure, my son's going to be hauled off into slavery, but oh, good, good. I'm glad I won't face the consequences for my actions. Jerk. He's not perfect. None of us are. But it's also important to note this. When God allowed him to get that infection and he was going to die, we almost wonder... What if Hezekiah had died? Just left on that high note in his life. We'll never know because it didn't happen. But it wasn't the only bad thing that happened as far as his integrity is concerned. Because during this 15 year period, he also had a boy. His name was Manasseh. And that's when we get to the death of Judah. You see, after Hezekiah died, Manasseh undid everything that his father did right. He put idols, not back in God's nation, he put idols in God's temple. He rebuilt all of the pagan shrines and personally sacrificed his own children on every one of their altars. Literally. He was, and this isn't biblical, this is just historical, extra sources like the rabbinical commentaries and traditions and so forth, but I'll mention it. Hezekiah was credited with sawing the prophet Isaiah in half, throwing his body inside of a log, and it wasn't intended to be a magic trick. He hunted down and murdered the people of God. He, hunt, he basically just went on a Jezebel spree. And then finally, when the Assyrians had gotten back their, at least some of their military, they hauled Manasseh off into captivity with a hook through his nose. And it was there as he was literally being dragged by a chariot by the tender part of his schnoz that he said, God, I'm sorry. Now this is where we would think, at least I would say, well, tough luck, Hitler. Should have thought of that before you started slaughtering your own people. I would say just slaughtering the Jews, but he was a Jew, so it's just even more ironic in this regard. No, what did what happened? God accepted his apology. I have no doubt that we'll see Manasseh in heaven. Why? Not because he deserved it. None of us deserve it. He understood his need for mercy. More than most. That's why oftentimes serial killers end up coming to Jesus for salvation more than rich billionaires. Because they understand what they need, and that's mercy. Unfortunately, when Manasseh is brought back, probably replaced with a nose ring, I don't know. He's brought back to Israel. He sees his son Amnon making the same mistakes that he did. And so when Manasseh dies, his son did everything his dad did and worse. And the people of Judah got so tired of it that even the, the pagans, the non-Christians in Israel, they, they wanted to kill him. So he was murdered by his own people. And finally, Judah's last good king was named Josiah. He found a copy of the Old Testament that Manasseh and Ammon didn't burn. And for the last time, Judah was restored to a relationship with God. However, once again, human, not perfect. And so Josiah, he didn't have to get into a battle with the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, 
but he chose to anyway. The Pharaoh warned him. The prophets of God warned him. He says, no, I can take him. But after all these warnings, you're, you're going to get killed in this battle. God's not going to be with you. God hasn't called you for this. Don't do it. He says, I know. I'll dress up like a common soldier, like King Ahab, because he was a smart guy. And that way, I won't be a open target. Well, one of the soldiers fired an arrow, not knowing where it would go, just in the general direction of where the enemy was coming. And he ended up getting shot. He died of his wounds there. And then the power passed to Jehoiahaz, and then Jehoiakim, and then finally Jehoiachin, who all rejected God. And then finally, God allowed Babylon to come in, take them all into captivity under the banner of a man named Nebuchadnezzar. This historical narrative is to be continued in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, as well as in Daniel. But before we get into that, we're going to do a timeout on Israel's progression of history and recap what we've learned so far. For Since I've held your attention for over an hour now, I won't do that at this moment. That's what the book of First and Second Chronicles are for. So I want to thank you here and now for listening to the study and going through Second Kings. Once again, a lot of details were covered, but not in exquisite detail. So if you have sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, please do so. But most importantly, if you know someone who's unfamiliar with this portion of history, probably not the parts you hear about a lot in Sunday school, please share this with anyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and listening to the study. Remember that Jesus loves you. And remember, from the ministry of Elisha all the way, to the Babylonian exile, God wasn't giving up on the people of Israel. And if you read these passages, you would know that there's this continual offer and opportunity for Israel to come back to God. And if he would give mercy to a guy like Manasseh, why wouldn't he to you and me?